Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about disseminated intravascular coagulation. Commonly, we see this type of problems in sepsis, infections, malignancies, road traffic accidents like trauma, various other conditions also, malig uh, hematological malignancies, you can get disseminated intravascular coagulation. We will see what is the mechanism of uh, disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation. Whenever there is a trigger, it can be an infection, it can be an inflammation, it can be an autoimmune disease, it can be a hematological malignancy, there will be increased coagulation, clotting forms. Because of this clotting, the coagulation factors are consumed, large amount of coagulation factors are consumed and platelets also are consumed to produce the clots. So there will be deficiency of platelets and clotting factors. And again uh, that clot will be lysed. So body will try to lyse this clot which is formed due to the trigger. So again the trigger is persisting, again clots are formed platelets are consumed, coagulation factors are consumed and ultimately body will lose all its platelet, uh, normal platelets and coagulation factors, patient develops bleeding. So that is called as DIC. DIC. So there are two important problems, one is uh, clot formation in the circulation that is lysed by body. Uh, so platelets and thrombins, uh, coagulation factors are consumed then they are lysed, again uh, reoccurrence of thrombus, uh, so consume, consumption is increased, so you can get a reduction in the platelet count and coagulation factors. Now the clot formation is leading to bleeding, that is very important, normally clot formation produces only block. But here, since it is a large amount of clots formed throughout the vascular system, body will try to uh, dissolve it. Again, clots are formed. So, consumption coagulopathy and consumption thrombocytopenia occurs here. And this thrombus can, whatever thrombus is produced in the system can even block the microcirculation in our body. So, there are few important points to remember. One is coagulation clots formed throughout our circulatory system that can block the circulatory system and consumption of platelets and uh, coagulation factors will produce cons consumption coagulopathy. Ultimately, that will lead to bleeding. So, here you can see activation of coagulation mechanism, thrombosis occurs, clot is lysed in our body by body itself then again clots are formed. So that leads to consumption coagulopathy and consumption thrombocytopenia. Patient develops hemorrhages. This is called as DIC. We will see what are the causes for DIC. The commonest cause is always infection. In India, we have a large number of uh, uh, different types of infections. Infectious diseases are very, very common in our ER. And diabetes is one of the important cause for uh, patient to develop infections. So, infection mainly by gram negative organism, meningococci, pneumococci, staphylococci, malaria, calazar, and other viral diseases. Obstructive syndromes, that is another important problem, abruptio placenta, amniotic fluid embolism, retained dead fetus. That is also very common in our country. Other conditions in that most important is snake bite especially a hematological poisoning like viper bite, then severe burns, severe trauma, pancreatitis, acute promyelocytic leukemia and other malignancies. Almost all types of malignancies can sometimes present with uh, this problem DIC, but uh, leukemia is one important condition where uh, DIC is very, very common. Blood transfusion rarely can produce uh, DIC, not very common, but it can produce. 
severe acute liver failure also you can develop uh, DIC but here in liver disease mostly prothrombin time is elevated but to diagnose uh, DIC you can learn afterwards that both PTNR and APTT has to be elevated so liver disease as such as such will not produce uh, uh, coagulation defects due to DIC but infections in a patient who is having uh, chronic liver disease or a severe liver failure can produce DIC. We can remember the causes with this mnemonic TOMB SLV trauma, obstetrics, malignancies, blood transfusion and burns, sepsis especially gram negative infection, severe liver failure, venoms that is mainly viper bite. Now, there are two important phases we have already seen that there is a thrombotic phase and there is a fibrinolytic phase. Thrombotic phase, microthrombi is formed throughout our circulation. It can obstruct the arteries or smaller blood vessels. Fibrinolysis occurs uh, due to these clots are lysed in our body. By body itself will lyse most of the clots and again consumption of uh, platelets and fibrin occurs that leads to consumption coagul coagulopathy and consumption thrombocytopenia that will lead ultimately bleeding. So, patient dies because of bleeding uh, not due to the thrombus. Now, thrombocytopenia also we have seen that it is due to consumption of platelets because whenever there is a clot formed in our body the main uh, problem in that will be platelet aggregation. So, initially platelet aggregation will be there, then fibrin will come to that thrombus and it will become a clot. So, both platelets and fibrins are there in almost all thrombus. So, platelet thrombosis is, uh, thrombosis, platelet induced thrombosis is very common in arterial thrombosis, but venous thrombosis also you can have platelets inside the thrombi or it can trigger uh, multiple thrombosis throughout the uh, system, vascular system. So, DIC leading both bleeding and thrombosis. We have seen why it produces thrombosis, why it produces bleeding. Bleeding is predominant because uh, thrombosis occurs in the early phase of the disease. So, we may not notice the thrombosis and we have no other uh, tool to detect thrombosis. D-dimer is there. So, if you do D-dimer initially it can be elevated, but most of the time these patients present in the late phase of the disease. So, bleeding is very, very common. It is around 64 percent of the patients with DIC can present with bleeding to ER, bleeding tendencies. It can occur to any sites. So, thrombosis, clinically it is very difficult to diagnose thrombosis, but rarely you can get digital ischemia and ischemic gangrene. So, many patients who are admitted in ICU who is having sepsis or septic uh, shock, you can see the fingers are blue in color. Mostly it is due to uh, multiple thrombosis in the circulation of the hand. So, once the patient uh, develops hemolysis, like due to thrombosis and hemolysis, patient can have hemolytic anemia also. Most of the time hemolytic anemia means patient can have anemia and jaundice. So, jaundice is due to the increased destruction of the RBCs. So, anemia and jaundice can be there in many patients with DIC. Now, we can see the lab investigation. Thrombocytopenia occurs in 98 percent of the patients. You can see the platelet counts are low, less than 1 lakh and clinically significant thrombocytopenia is less than 10,000 because th that time they can have spontaneous bleeding. But some patients at any platelet count patient can have bleeding especially patient is on drugs like aspirin and clopidogrel they can have uh, defective platelets and they can have uh, bleeding at any time. Prothrombin time is elevated and INR also elevated. You should remember that we have both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. So, prothrombin time indicates one pathway, APTT indicates another pathway. So, both PT, INR and APTT is elevated. The final pathway forms the fibrinogen. 
So fibrinogens also reduce. The low serum fibrinogen is very, very important to make a diagnosis of DIC. So hypofibrinogenemia, there is a range less than 100 milligram per deciliter. That is very important. Normal range being 175 to 433, but the panic level is less than 100 milligram per deciliter. So when once you see that we have to treat with cryoprecipitate, but when we are treating with cryoprecipitate, the target uh, fibrinogen levels in our body is 150 milligram per deciliter. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is another important feature of uh, DIC. Patient can have fragmented cells in blood cell, uh, blood peripheral smear, and uh, you can also get jaundice. LDH will be elevated. Antithrombin 3 is also reduced in many patients due to consumption of the antithrombin 3. Elevated D dimer is a marker of fibrin degradation product. But uh, that occurs in many patients who is having snake bite, who is having sepsis, who is having pneumonia. So many other conditions also uh, D dimer is elevated. So it is not a specific feature of uh, uh, DIC but it can also be elevated due to increased amount of thrombin formation in our blood. Now you can see here you have intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway for coagulation cascade. For intrinsic pathways we do activated partial thromboplastin time APTT. For extrinsic pathway we do prothrombin time and international normalized ratio. So there are some conditions which elevates APTT like positioned on heparin, it, it elevates only APTT. There are some pa conditions like chronic liver disease or patient on warfarin elevates PT and INR. But here both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways are damaged because of the deficiency of all the factors in coagulation system. Common pathway is affected and fibrinogen level also reduced. So if there is elevation in APTT and elevation in INR and reduction in fibrinogen. So the final common pathway and other two pathways of intrinsic and extrinsic pathway all are affected here. That indicates a complete shutdown of coagulation system. So that is DIC. So when you are suspecting DIC, you need to have three important lab investigation, elevated PTINR elevated APTT, total reduction in the fibrinogen levels. That gives the diagnosis that is DIC. Now, once you diagnose DIC, you know that uh, coagulation factors are reduced, platelets are reduced, so we have to give fresh frozen plasma. Coagulation factor deficiency can be corrected only with fresh frozen plasma. The dose is 10 to 20 milli ml per kg, so we have to give that. And normally PT, uh, uh, PT and INR, if you check, INR is always 1. If INR is more than 1.5, we have to be very careful. And if the patient is developing bleeding tendency or if, if INR is going very high, we have to treat the patient with FFP. 200 to 250 ml of FFP can increase coagulation factors by about 2%. That is a problem of FFP. We have to give larger amount of FFP in most of the patients. So 10 to 20 ml per kg, that is a normal dose to increase the FFP to a uh, safe range. Another important thing is uh, cryoprecipitate. If the fibrinogen levels are low, less than 100 mg per deciliter, we have to start cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate is uh, prepared from FFP only, uh, plasma only, so we have to give cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate, 1 to 2 bags of cryoprecipitate per 10 kg, that is a dose, 1 to 2 bags of cryoprecipitate per 10 kg. So that has to be given. Fibrinogen is replaced with cryoprecipitate and the aim for plasma fibrinogen uh, level of 150 milligram per deciliter. One unit of cryoprecipitate usually raises the fibrinogen level by 6 to 8 milligram per deciliter so that 15 units of cryoprecipitate will raise the level from 50 to 150 milligram per deciliter. The replacement of 10 to 15 units of cryoprecipitate for every 2 to 3 unit of FFP. So that is a dose of cryoprecipitate. 
Now next is platelet transition. So we have FFP, we have cryoprecipitate, we have platelet transition. So you have seen that uh, previous slides, you have uh, some important points, platelets are reduced and coagulation factors are reduced, fibrinogen is reduced. So platelets, we, we have to give platelet transition. Total coagulation factors, we have to give FFP. For fibrinogen, we have to start, transfuse cryoprecipitate. So platelet transfusion, 6 to 8 units if the platelet count drops below 20,000. Or sometimes some uh, normal uh, guideline is if less than 10,000, we have to transfuse. But here we have to understand uh, platelet deficiency is there, uh, APDT is prolonged, PTINR is prolonged. So it's a multifactorial disease. So 20,000 itself, we, we have to transfuse the platelet count, platelet transfusion, otherwise patient may bleed. Dose 1 to 2 units per 10 kg body weight are sufficient for most DIC patients with severe thrombocytopenia. And we can check INR, APTT uh, and uh, other investigation like platelet uh, every 6 to 8 hours. Normally INR and PT you can uh, and APTT you can see the changes within 6 to 8 hours. Now heparin is controversial but uh, what you, you have to understand is in early phase itself if we are able to pick up DIC uh, that is at the time of uh, thrombus formation heparin is helpful. So many guidelines say that initial phase of DIC you can give heparin but once the patient develops bleeding tendency then heparin will be dangerous. So initially heparin can be tried but even then some patients it may produce uh, like clinical difficulty because you know that heparin can itself can produce bleeding tendency and heparin also increases APTT. So it can it can sometimes produce, uh, produce clinical deterioration and sometimes it can produce lab deterioration. Both are possible. We have to be very careful when we are giving heparin. Only in early phase of the disease we can give heparin. So we have discussed about one important clinical condition that is disseminated intravascular coagulation. Nowadays it is very common in our emergency room because many patients are coming with malignancy, uh, sepsis, snake bite and so many other triggers for uh, intravascular coagulation. We cannot uh, tell which is going to be the trigger for a given patient. So even some food items uh, or some allergens or uh, any other factor can become a trigger for any patient, but especially uh, DIC is uh, classically seen in patients like uh, uh, malignancy patients, leukemia patients, um, sepsis patients uh, and those who are taking steroids for a longer time or immunomodulators for a longer time, post-transplant patients, all these patients, uh, the chances are very high. Thank you. <music>